If you want to be consistent with exercise for the rest of your life, it's important to fully understand and appreciate all of the benefits exercise brings you. Okay, to be more specific, when you first get started, one of the things you might want to do is not watch your progress in the mirror or the scale. We're all aware of how exercise affects the way that we look or weigh, and sometimes it gets in the way of all the other incredible benefits that exercise provides. When you get that full picture, you can then create a relationship with exercise that lasts the rest of your life. Do you think you can get there before tackling like whatever the said goal was that got you to the gym? Oh, I mean, can you? Yeah, likely, probably not. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I don't, you know, I've, I've thought about this a lot. Like a, part of, I think what helped this process for me was actually getting the, reaching the physical goals, right? Like, and seeing that, seeing how I felt, seeing that, feeling that moment. And it's like, okay, it came and went. It's like, now what? Yeah. Um, had I not reached that, I wonder if I would still be chasing that and, and, and still feel like, ah, oh, I've just, but I've never felt this way or I've yeah. never got it. And, you know, it's like, it's kind of like the same thing too with it. We've talked about this comparing the your like financial journey. Like when you, when you come from nothing and you have this goal financially of like, Oh, if I just made, you know, a million dollars or whatever, I'd be so happy. I'd be yeah. so happy. Right. And, and I don't think, uh, I don't think any wise, even, even wise older version of me coming back in time and telling me like, that's not mm -hmm. going to, like, I don't think I listen. I think I have right. to go do it to feel it and recognize it my, yeah. myself. So do you think it's possible for somebody who's entering their their journey of fitness, who's you know insecure about being forty pounds overweight, and feels that they just got to get this weight off desperately or whatever, C can you get them to shift their focus on what you're alluding to right now? Well, that's or what I'm going to try and do. Um, you know, with this conversation, is hopefully get people kind of, um, you know, consider it because okay, so let's let's take a step back. If you're getting started or you've been on this journey, the ideal situation is you never stop, right? So I think if you were to ask the average person who gets started with exercise and fitness and and you say, okay, ideally speaking, uh, in a perfect world, would you keep doing this forever or would you stop? And they'd say, well, I'd, I'd like to be able to do this forever. Okay, so if, if this is going to be something you're going to do for the rest of your life, which could be 30, 40, 50, 60 years or more, then essentially what you're doing is you have to develop a relationship with this activity where you're going to want to continue doing it for that long. And your best bet at doing that is to get a full understanding of what this will provide you. You know, I, 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 re, I think about the data on body acceptance um, and body satisfaction. When you look at the data on the average age that people can say that they feel most satisfied uh, or they accept their body is in their fifties and sixties, mm. right? Fifties and sixties, like objectively speaking, just in terms of aesthetics, right? Like you, you don't look your best when you're in your fifties or sixties. <laughs> Nobody people would does. Think, <laughs> yeah. People would think you're twenties, right? <laughs> or, you know, that, that would be when you look your best or whatever. And yet the data shows that, when, that this is the, the highest odds of body acceptance is right around there. So what does that tell you? It has less to do with what, how you look, there's a lot more that goes into this. So, you know, I could say right now with full confidence, and I think people, nobody would disagree, right? Exercise gives you more, if you do it right, right? Gives you more energy, improves your mobility, uh, improves your mood. The data shows it's very in incredibly powerful antidepressant, anti-anxiety uh, activity, uh, balances out your hormones. And then through that, right, the filter through which you receive the world is more positive. So things don't seem as bad. Things seem more positive. You feel more resilient. But the problem is, is that we we hyper-focus on two aspects of the effects of exercise, which is like my weight and how I look, therefore ignoring all the others. And in the pursuit of those two, weight and appearance, we end up sacrificing all those other things. We end up moving in the wrong direction. And then we end up developing a relationship with exercise where we hate it. It doesn't mm -hmm. work. I don't like this. It doesn't feel good. I'm not getting what I thought I would get. And so it's no wonder people stop. Now, if people, if they put this, if they took the scale, and I used to do this with clients, and when I can get them to agree to it, it was very powerful. It's like, take your scale, throw it away or, or hide it. Don't look in the mirror or at least don't study yourself in the mirror. Let's do this for 60 days. Can you do mm -hmm. this for 60 days? And at the end of 60 days, they were always shocked 
at the results they had gotten because they weren't focused so heavily on it. And what happens because they're not weighing themselves, look in the mirror, you have no other, it'd be like if I put a blindfold on you, how much more aware you would be of your hearing mm-hmm. and of your, of your, of touch and of smells because you, you, you're not able to focus on sight. So by not focusing on those, you're, you're allowing yourself to be more aware of all the other potential benefits. Then when you develop that relationship with it, well, now it's this thing that you're going to always want to do because it improves everything. Yeah. I was thinking about your question, Adam, because, um, I think, you know, thinking back, I've had clients that are a lot more mature than, um, most and and then some that aren't, you know, and it's usually like the younger clients that come in will have this kind of idea of what they want to do and they're, they're just going to do it regardless and they're going to make mistakes. And, you know, it's just kind of part of the journey is they're going to make mistakes and they're going to pursue things that, um, you know, might not be the most ideal. Uh, but then again, if you can propose something like, I, I just think that message probably isn't put out there enough for yeah. them to see as an option. Like, yeah. like let's, let's really draw this out and look at it for what it is to see, well, maybe this is actually going to last the longest. My body is going to get to that place I want it to, but it's just going to be a real gradual progression. And uh, I'm going to be working with my body and I'm not going to be like really, you know, pushing it to this extreme that I had in my own ideas coming into this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a really good point. Like maybe my perception of it is because it's so attached to 20 year old me. Yeah. And maybe if, a 40 year old me was just now trying to get into shape for the first time in his life. And he found a good trainer. Or right. And maybe, that. maybe uh, just the maturity of, and, and maybe because I can draw that to like money and other things like, Oh, Oh, so it's kind of like that journey. Like I get it. Like, so I've learned this with other things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so maybe, maybe 40 year old me would be able to do that. 20 year old me, no way. Right. Yeah. But so maybe you're right. It's not, it's less to do with like that. You have to go through that journey per se and more so that there is a uh, emotional self-awareness maturity that you probably need to be at in order to you know what, s- to see that. You know what the irony of this is, is when you do what we're saying, you'll end up looking better yeah, than had you totally. not. So this is actually the path towards what you think you want. Yeah. And, and then speaking on, on appearance, you know, I was having this conversation earlier on a podcast and, um, you know, it, it, it really became very clear to me. I'll use another example, kind of illustrate where I'm going to go. But if you were to, if you, if you consume fitness information, media, social media and fitness information, you would, you would get the distorted, you would get a very distorted idea of how effective supplements are because the fitness industry is an industry and it's a market like all markets. So it's there to generate revenue. Supplements are a revenue generator. So a lot of the information that's put out there is to generate revenue from supplements. So a lot of information that's out there talks about supplements you would get the idea, and a lot of people do, and I did all as a kid, you read everything and you think supplements make much more of an impact than they actually do because the information that's put out is constantly talking about supplements. Well, media also puts out and lies to you through this that it says looking, having a six pack or looking attract, super attractive or flawless is, gonna, is way more important to your happiness than it actually is. You think it's one of the most amazing things. Like, oh my God, if I just look like that person, I would be so happy. They have very good, clear data on this. And it's actually, Arthur Brooks told me this, uh, I think on our podcast. He said, if, if you were a, on a scale of, uh, of one to 10, you were a five in terms of attractiveness. And you spent money and time and effort and years moving from a five to a nine, your happiness would barely move up a little bit. Of all the things that will affect your happiness, he's like, that will barely... Now, having good health, much bigger impact. Having better mental health, much bigger impact. Relationships with the people around you, having meaningful work, um, you know, not being in pain, those kinds of things, which exercise also provides. Yeah. But what we're doing is we're putting all the value on our appearance because we think the appearance is what's going to give us all these things. And it's totally distorted. Yes. It's a big sure. lie. You you also risk that you get there and you recognize that you're not any happier. And then you have the attitude of like, oh, why even do this? Yeah. And then you throw it out the window completely. Like you were, you're so obsessed with reaching this, you know, goal, this vanity goal. And you get there, you realize you're not any happier than what you were before. And you put all that work, sacrifice it. And then you go like, oh, this is not even for me. And then you write it off completely. So I think it's so important that you we teach our clients to attach it to all these other things because 
you do risk you risk one like you originally said being so obsessed that you it drives you into unhealthy things to to reach mm -hmm. it or you actually reach it and then you realize oh how unfulfilled you are or oh it didn't make you any happier and then you have the attitude of f it why even do that you know it's funny i bet you i don't know there's no studies that, would, that i could pull from but i would make bet money that if you took the mental health of extreme physique owners, like super ripped, super buffed, whatever, like fanatic, crazy, orthorexic, whatever, like super obsessed fitness people. If you were to sample their mental health, it would probably be very similar to unhealthy, obese individuals. Hmm. I bet you would find yeah. a very, they would, it would be very similar in terms of their mental health. But I mean, we know this, how many people do we know in our space that, you know, they post pictures and they look like whatever and you meet them and you know them, you're like, oh man, they are struggling. I mean, this is because they traded one addiction for another. Yeah. You have this, the, the, both mentally unhealthy, same, same mentally unhealthy person, just uh, one of them abused food. In one way. And then in one way. And then the other, then they went the other direction and, and abused it by restricting from it and over obsessing about movement and exercise. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I always think, I think it's interesting too. Cause it's like, you, I mean, you always like to pull back and draw back to like evolution. And it's like, I don't think we evolved to work out in a gym seven days a week. I don't think that was like the, I don't think, I think that's something that we've adopted because we've technology and things have evolved that we've actually lost movement. Like we don't work anymore. We don't do laborious jobs anymore, but where's the balance of that? Like, where is there like, yeah, it's a, we recognize the importance of our bodies moving and picking up heavy things yeah. and doing hard stuff. Uh, but then there's the other side of it. It's like when it becomes your life focus and you're obsessed with it. And it's like, so where where is that? Does it improve the quality of your life or take away from it? So what are the, what are the important things in life? That's a hard one though, Sal, because the people that- They don't know. Yeah, because yeah. a lot of people, and I know you've met people like this that- you know, uh, physically are, you know, look amazing and they're in the gym seven days a week would, would tell you that their, their life is yeah. much better because aspects of it probably is right. Yeah. There's parts that they probably get complimented and feel confident. They're strong. They look better than they ever have. Uh, I mean, and they're, they're probably sleeping better than they were before when they were, you know, fat and lazy. Like, so there's, there's enough things that they can draw to where they would they would make the connection and saying that their life is well. Does it improve your relationships or does it take away from your relationships? Does it improve your mood or take away from your mood? Does it improve your ability to be productive? Take away? Does it make you a better husband or a worse husband? A better father or a worse father? Yeah, are you like, well rounded. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things. Are you easy to hang out with? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, you know. I don't know. It's sometimes people can get in this like hyper obsessed. Which is fine. Like we get, we all have hobbies and we all have like interests and things that we really pour ourselves into. Um, you just have to kind of check yourself on some level. Of I, like it's your, all, I, your entire world. I mean, I guess I, I just, I operate from that same place of my goal is to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change. And so my philosophy as I've gotten older is I, Am I, wanna, I doing more than I, I, need I don't want to work out hardly at all. If I, as little as I can to obtain being strong, being fit and mobile, being capable. So you could do all the other stuff. So yeah. I could do all the other things. Yeah, I know. And that's it. Like, I just like, what's the, what's the least amount? I got to go to this, this building and yeah. pick up these weird shaped weights. So I, and it's literally, so I could go do all the other things. So I could get down and play with my son and not get tired. So I could carry things for my wife when we need to go somewhere. So I could protect my family if we were to att be attacked. So I could go do sports and activities that I love to do. So whatever the amount of time I got to spend in that gym. That's great. Yeah. Is, is the, I want to yeah. spend as You're little as possible. filling your cup up so that to, way you can, you know. To do all that other shit. Else. Yeah. Any more than that is What? To yeah. feed my ego, yep, yeah, basically. just so I can say I'm stronger than that guy, some other guy that's obsessed. Like it's like other than that, it's like so to me, it's like I'm always m measuring that and going, okay, like totally, what what, what what more can I apply so I get more out of these other things? When it becomes the cornerstone uh, of your life, I just I think you're out of There's balance. An evaluation that needs to happen. I, yeah. it, it, what's interesting too is uh, you know we we there's definitely a, um, signals that are being sent when you look at someone who's fit and healthy. And then what we've done is we've idolized that, but that's always for all human history. That was never the goal. That was a sign that there was something behind that, that meant something valuable. In other words, if you are a woman 
for 99.9999% of human history. And you saw a man with broad shoulders, look strong, good posture, look like he was mobile. That told you, oh, he could probably, he could probably do things. He's probably healthy. He's probably, uh, you know, viral uh, or, or, you know, uh, if, it, when you look at a, a woman who's fit and healthy, it's like, oh, she could reproduce. She's healthy. She's not sick. She can move well. What's happened is we've taken the, the, the sign and made that the goal. Like, no, that's everything. It's all about what you look like, not what it potentially could represent. By the way, I'm speaking from a place of struggle myself. <laughs> this is my con continual. I mean, I've been working out for over 30 years and this is something that I constantly have to like examine and check myself on because I easily, I go there often or that then becomes the, 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 the goal is to just spend time in the gym or do more exercise or whatever. Um, and so this is, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a place of like, look, this is, I know what this is like, but it's a con, it's a continual conversation. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know if you ever, re even, even from my angle, right. Which is kind of the opposite side. Like I'm still always having that too. Cause easily I can get to the justification of like, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so there, it, it's a constant conversation. Yeah, it's not yeah. this like, oh, I have it all figured out. It's that. I'm always evaluating it because there's always like, there's always something I go and do oh, shit. Doug and I just recently uh, went skiing and like the, the note to self was, eh, I could use a little more cardio endurance. Oh, cause it was affecting your, yeah. Opinion. You know yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah. saying? Like, I, I mean, just carrying my snowboard from the truck up the hills to get up there. I'm like, whew, okay. I was a little more winded than I should be. Yeah, like, yeah, so yeah. that's like that check. Nice so, check. Yeah. It's like this check-in of like, Hey, and, and again, why? Not so I could run an Iron Man or say that I'm faster than one of you. It's because I love that. That's something that gives me so much joy in my life. And I don't want to lose the ability to do that or say like, oh, I don't want to go snowboarding because yeah. that sounds like so much yeah. work and I can't do it. Like that's, I don't ever want to say it for that reason. So that is what will drive what I do in the gym in the next couple of I just, I can't help but think it's like, um, we're never ever in a, in a period where you're in perfect balance. You're always chasing and pursuing balance. Sure. Yeah. And so it's like, and if you stop thinking about that, you're going to be even further away from balance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. So, you know, to, for me to try and keep and maintain my strength, like I have to always have a conversation with myself. Like what, what, you know, area should I kind of focus on now? Uh, you know, or if I've been sort of neglecting certain relationships or certain aspects of business or whatever it is, like you're just kind of like, constantly evaluating uh, where where the need is. And mm -hmm. it's going to be constantly changing depending on the seasons of your life. Yeah. There's going to be times, like I remember when bringing, bringing Max into this world, like it was just a, that's right, right before that was when I went on this like obsessed journey of being able to sit down and squat. Like, and so it was like a massive goal to be able to just like get down in a comfortable position. Like, can I, can I get to a place where I can be comfortable in the squatted position and, and play with my son on the floor to where I don't have to like lay down on my side or I'm all <laughs> kneeling half like dad <laughs> kneeling, you know what I'm saying? That you yeah. like, I don't want to do that. Like I want to be able to hop down there and, and play with him and be agile. Like that's a, and that, that will change. Right. So it just yeah. depends on the season of your life and evaluate. And I, to me, that's like, that's really what all of, all of yes, this. Yes, because if you're going to do this for the rest of your life, like how how else are you going to develop that relationship? Is it really going to be how you look when you're 60, 70? I mean, it can't, it's not. And people, when you meet people and working out for a long time, it isn't anymore. They've, they figured that out. By the way, speaking of, I mean, with little kids, like you, if when you're a dad and you have little kids, you do realize the value of exercise and fitness because little kids, <laughs> they're awesome. little nuclear reactors. Yep. They don't run out of energy. They no. want to play on the ground. And one of the worst feelings ever, this ever happened to you where you're like, your kid wants to play with you and you feel tired. Yeah. Like, oh God, you know, and you're like, oh, I don't want to drudge through this. I want my kid to be excited to play with him. I want to be excited to play with him. You know? I mean, that's a, that's a, that's yep. seriously, that's a big part of my, my, and, and so again, when you, when you design your workouts or when you go into a workout, it's like, uh, right now I'm not hitting my PR anywhere near my PR squats or deadlift. I can still pull 400 pounds off the ground and comfortably squat 300. No problem, but I'm nowhere near my, my PRs right. or that stuff. But where is, where is me adding 50 more pounds of the bar on either one of those lifts support my ability to play with him, you know, or help my wife pick something up and carry it. Like 
no, nowhere. So then if the extra energy that I would put to putting 50 more pounds on that bar would be better served doing mobility drills or doing things like that, because that's going to serve me at the current season. Or of maybe my life. work on another aspect of your health, like spiritual health sure, or absolutely. reading or learning. Ex yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's yeah. like constantly having these check-ins uh, and looking at your, your, your health as this pie chart of all these different things, spiritual health, relationship health, mobility, strength, endurance, like it all is in this, this fear at different points, points of your life. M more of them are going to be at different priorities and always checking in and going like, okay, where am, where am, where am I at? And then where should my gym be focused around? Today's giveaway on YouTube is maps aesthetic. To enter that contest to win, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and then turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. Also, this month's program sale, Maps Anabolic, half off, and Maps Anabolic Advanced, also half off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Be speaking of spiritual health, I, I told Adam the story this morning, but I'll tell you, Justin, it's like the craziest craziest things have been happening, uh, recently to me. So I'm on this really like deep, uh, spiritual journey. I've been reading scripture and I've been feeling pulled, uh, just to, 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 you know, become different, become better in certain ways or whatever. So I'm driving to work this morning. I'm in my car. Right. And so when you get off the freeway over here, sometimes there's like a homeless person standing next to the exit. And I guess that's a good place for them to get money. Right. To hold a sign or something like that. Uh -huh. So there's a dude there standing there and I've just been, you know, I've been like really on this, on this journey and uh, this homeless guy standing there with a sign. So I'm like, oh man, I feel pulled to like, maybe give him some money or something, right? So I kind of have like a little like, oh, you know, like inner check, because there's always that like, what if I give him money, what's he gonna do with it? Is it really gonna help him type of deal? But I'm like, you know what? You know, I don't know, I, I think I, I think I should, you know, do this. And so I, I say like a prayer, like, you know, basically help me make the right decision. I open my wallet and I have four $100 bills. I'm like, you ain't getting a hundred bucks. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a, Oh man. Yeah, sorry, bro. Like, you don't get a hundred bucks today, you know, expensive, yeah. but I, you know, I said that kind of prayer in my head or whatever. Now, meanwhile, it's just true. Swear to God, Justin, I'm listening to the book of Matthew in my car. It's playing my car, right? Uh -huh. So I look at my wallet. I see the hundreds. I already like, nah, you're not getting a hundred buddy. Sorry. <laughs> Say a little prayer. And then Right when I do that, the story uh, in Matthew of the rich man going to Jesus and saying, how do I get into the kingdom of heaven? He goes, sell all your, he's a rich guy. Yeah. He says, sell all your all belongings, your possessions, give them to yeah. the poor, come <laughs> yeah. follow me. So I hear that, right? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, come on, man. No. Light turns green and I kind of drive off and I feel like so conflicted. I'm like, oh man, what do I do? I got to get here for a podcast or whatever. But I, I mean, seriously, how, how crazy is that that yeah. I got that? You're almost better like off that. not asking. I, I know, dude. I was like, ah. Oh. It's now, always tough lessons. Hey, you know, I found yeah. time. I found time, though. Did afterwards. you find him? I did. Oh, wow. I drove all the way oh, back because it was it was like weighing on me. So I did yeah. a podcast interview. It was weighing on me. And I'm like, oh. I'm like, you know what? That's how obvious. <laughs> now, did, sign you just, you get? did you just give it and walk right. away? Or did you ask him to do something? I asked him to pray for me. You did. Yeah. You so, did. and, and, uh, and he, it, he said some really nice things to me, this guy, He's some really nice things about my family and whatever. So it was really nice, but you got a nice crisp hundred dollar bill. So there yeah. you go, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Don't thank me. Thank God. Cause yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he talked to me at that moment. Oh God. It's so oh, funny. Lord. I know it was God. so funny. It was like one of those moments where you just shake your head. You're like, all right, dude, it could be a 20 in here somewhere. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. what are the odds? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, that's funny, funny stuff. Dude. I gotta give you guys, I gotta tell you guys of a review, um, of one of our listeners who's been using a GLP one agonist, uh, mm. called uh terzepatide. So terzepatide, Semaglutide, uh, you know, the brand names we go V Ozempic. Um, these are like making the news as these like peptides that are up until now, there's nothing's been shown to be more effective at <coughs> weight loss. And it doesn't have the side effects of previous weight loss, drug, loss drugs. It's not a stimulant or whatever. Right. People are using them and they're just, it's just working. So this guy, he heard us talking about it and he wrote kind of a review of what's happening with him. And it's not just the weight loss part that blows me away. And I keep reading stuff like this, which is wild. So he started on terzepatide. He's on one-tenth the normal starting dose, which by the way, when they start you out, they typically start you out at a very, very small dose just to see what's see an effective the, dose. Yeah. And I also so. didn't know this. I think it's like a once a week injection. I don't think it's an everyday injection. I think it's once a week. 
Interesting. Okay, yeah. Bad. So yeah. Because so it, for people who are afraid of everyday sub Q injection, I think it's once a week. That's 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 okay. That, that makes sense to me because I know if you were to do growth hormone, you do growth hormone. I don't think every it's day. a short acting peptide. I think it's la maybe uh, long lasting. Maybe Doug, you can confirm this. Put how often do you have to inject <laughs> terzepatide, or how often do you have to inject some glutide? And that's the specific one our MP hormones partners have. They have terzepatide. Right? Yeah. They work with some of glutide. So that's the one I ordered, by the way. That's the one you're going to do weekly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh? So it's, it's once once a week. Once a week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I know that. Like, what was it last? Was it last week when we talked <laughs> about this? Yeah, I should yeah, I mine. So. Mine should be so. Uh, check this out. This is what this person's saying. So they're they started on it, and he goes, "No negative side effects. One hundred percent taking away the food fixation." So mm. this is the words he used that I've always struggled with. I can't remember a time when I wasn't already thinking about my next meal, even though I just finished eating. Now here's the crazy part: I'm still hungry, no nausea, no headaches, but also not fixated on food. So it's not like it kills your appetite. He's just not obsessing about food. And huh. then here's the other part. And this is what I keep hearing. The which cravings is, a bit, huh? Here's the part that's weird. I've also noticed that I have zero desire to engage in, in some other negative behaviors, binging, procrastination, and a few others, because the hedonistic aspect around them isn't there anymore. That's weird. the weird. Yeah. That's the weird thing. Well, about so these. for the audience, I'm a, I'm been a, a few I'm, people I've ordered that. It. And no one's more honest than Adam. <laughs> yeah. And I'll he tell will you say what, yeah. what it's like. Exactly what's going on. I think it's going to be really interesting. I, and I've definitely <clears throat> paid attention to, I've talked about it. You're the perfect so person. I've talked Jesus, about yeah. my relationship uh, with sugar, with mm -hmm. Diet Cokes, with all these different things that I'm very, very aware of my pull and draw to it. So it'll be mm -hmm. really interesting. And so I tell you one of the things why I didn't. Uh, do it right away when we first talked about it, i was like you know though like the last thing i want is it for it to reduce my appetite so much that i have an even harder time hitting my protein intake yeah yeah i'd be worried about that too. because that's my 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 biggest struggle because eating that much protein you're, you're you'd have to what do you have to hit 220 yeah 220 plus dude i'm that's 230 hard. you know what yeah. i'm saying so it, to, in order to maintain that like my body type from all these years of training to build muscle Unfortunately, if I eat bad, you know, quote unquote bad, where I'm not paying attention to my food, eating out, doing stuff like that, I, I'll lose. Like I just, I, I lose muscle. Now my weight will stay about the same, but I just drop muscle and and build and, and gain body fat. Mm. It's like the worst. <laughs> so it's You're like the worst. Of it is. It's like I, I mean, if I just got a little fatter, I'd be like, yeah, hey, whatever. You know, what I'm saying. <laughs> but I, 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 but I lose my muscle at the same rate. It's like it's awful. So that's my biggest fear is that okay so it curbs all these cravings and appetites but then i'm still struggling to eat so that's really mm. interesting that the feedback was he's still hungry but not doing so the i'm most interested in hearing what you have to say so the person that i know that's close to me that's taking semaglutide hasn't noticed any of these other effects but does say that they're not fixated on food they still enjoy it they just don't want to eat as much but they haven't noticed anything else but i have read other people saying they're reducing other um like bad habits and then I'm, uh, I've been reading about some people having antidepressant and anti-anxiety effects from it. In fact, there's some studies hmm. where they're looking at the potential, and, and, and it makes sense, right? If if it is acting on the parts of the brain that are that are seeking, uh, like distraction or hedonistic pleasure, that that maybe it is an antidepressant in some cases. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. I don't know, but I, I'm interested to hear if you have any yeah. behavioral changes. Yeah, I just text Katrina right now, and it's mm -hmm. like it's already on its way. So I should be getting it in the next couple of weeks. And did, now, does anyone talk to you about how soon? So should I expect it to happen relatively quick? Also, the first I'm assuming few I'm assuming I should probably come off of my growth hormone at the same time. I shouldn't be running. I don't need to be I don't running. think it matters. Oh, you don't think it matters? No, I don't. So I, I can do both? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I, I would double check that, but I'm pretty sure that doesn't okay. matter. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I know. I know, right? Uh, and, um, along the lines of eating, you know, I had a, a great conversation about, um, you know, helping to teach kids how to develop a good relationship kind of with food. And uh, I was explaining it to this individual and I, I realized I never really explained it really well on the podcast because he was kind of asking me some questions. And it's a very different approach from the one that I had with my older kids. So I have, you know, for people who don't know, I have two older kids from a first marriage and then two younger kids from uh, the, my well, my wife now. And the age gap is pretty big. My, my daughter, 14, and then I have a son that's three. So there's 11 year difference. And the way that I am with food now is very different than I was with my older kids. The way I was with my older kids was very educational. Protein does this, carbs does this. You can only eat that if you finish this first type of deal. I thought that was like the best approach. 
But um, what I found, and you see this a lot with people in our space. Oh, this is what prompted it. The episode with uh, Jason Kalipa, which by the way, we're getting oh, crazy yeah. messages on. Oh, wow. mm. Crazy amounts of messages. Anyway, he was extremely vulnerable. In that. People was, are like, yeah. thank, thank you for putting this up. Uh, I was in tears. I struggled. My, my daughter, my son, you know, whatever, like mm -hmm. really big. So that's what prompted this, this uh, conversation. Um, a lot of people in the fitness and health space, uh, we end up causing these problems with our kids because we fixate on the health effects and do this and do that and do this and do that. And the reason why that causes an issue is because the skills that you need in today's world uh, with food, especially for little kids, is you want them to learn to have a kind of relationship with food where they can listen to their internal cues, where they don't eat to please other people or not eat in order to avoid shame or ridicule. Like you want them to develop a relationship with food that's kind of like comfortable, balanced, where they don't feel like they have to use food to numb themselves, distract themselves, or or restrict food in that mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. And so it's very different. So what we do now is when I present, a, when we eat dinner, we will put four or five options on a plate for my kid. And I pick one or two that I know that he'll like for sure. Like I know he likes you know, res raspberries. And I know that he likes rice, for example. Yeah. So that'll be on there. Then I'll put stuff that I think he'll eat, but that he should eat, that he needs to eat. So like some lamb or some meat. And then I'll put a couple things that I know he doesn't like, but I want to present him with so that he can learn to kind of understand, you know, start to uh, appreciate maybe different textures like olives and maybe some broccoli. And you put them in front of him and then you don't make a big deal about it. And they eat what they eat and they don't eat what they don't. And you just continue presenting it that way. Now, the, the, the difference is you don't let your kids eat whatever they want because some people are like, oh, you just let your kid. No, no, no. Obviously, they're impulsive. They don't have the skills yet. to. So you present them the choices that you are okay with, and then you let them make their choices, and you make it not a big deal. And then you do your own thing. And then little by little, they start to develop that confidence. And, you mm -hmm. know, this is this is. I feel like I, I feel like we're, you know, I, I really feel for parents that um, are trying to figure this out after the fact. Yeah. Like <clears throat> this really has not been, um, you know, so far, right. We're coming up on five years. This has not been a challenge for us at all, but I, but we went in it with intent. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and what I think is the first and foremost is what we do, what we do, and 100%. What, we, what we do and what we eat. My, my son is uh, kids learn what you model yeah, more than anything. He's, yeah. he's, uh, he's never craved uh, fast food cause he's never seen fast food in our house. You know what I'm saying? Like real fast food. If we eat out, it's like Nick, the Greek chicken on a stick, right. Yeah. That he called, which is one of his favorite things to have. So, you know, he, he consistently, and when we eat, it's not, he has his dish and then we have, we eat together. It's the same food. It's like, and it's just not a real big deal. And sometimes, you're not doing the whole, like you have to eat yeah, all that. No. Yeah, sometimes yeah. he eats a lot. Sometimes it's less like, you know, I was, I was even thinking about the other day, like I've had some, some nieces and nephews in my family in the past, uh, um, like we're really overweight kids. And, um, I remember thinking about like, Oh, when I have a kid one day, I like, I, I'm not going to let him, you know, get like that overweight. That's unhealthy. And I don't even like, I, I've been trying to figure out like, what is it that probably caused their kids to put on that much behavior? That's so, because I really don't, we don't really like, we don't restrict Max at all. And there's times when that kid, yeah. he eats more than me sometimes. And I don't tell him he can't. I mean, he's making all whole food choices. He's eating like crazy and I'll let him just go eat when you're, but he doesn't eat snacks. He eats food, yeah. you know, eats whole foods. And that's just kind of how we've done it is like, Hey, you're hungry. Go have a banana. Oh, you want something to eat? There's the chicken left over from yesterday. There's like, so he can have it if he's hungry and we don't go, Oh, you can only have this. And he's always maintained, and he's not like a like a sports kid, so he's not like super active. Like I feel like Aurelius is really yeah. active, right? Mm -hmm. Physically runs everywhere. Does like I mean, Max and I wrestle, and he plays, and he definitely plays, but he's uh, he's also content sitting and building his Legos or reading or doing stuff like that. And Wade has managed really like there isn't there's never been a, a a thing where he I feel like he's put on too much weight. No, I think if you give him if you uh model it uh is a big one cuz some kids their houses it's like unlimited mm -hmm. uh um you know junk food. Mm -hmm. It's like the pantry's full of it. That's what the parents eat, it's what everybody eats and it's unlimited. There's no governing in the sense that That's you know, the only way I can I yes. think this is happening, right? Yes. It's got to be like you're not governing it. You're allowing them to eat whenever, and then they're you're allowing. And they're them, eating what you eat. Yeah, you Doritos, eat yes. candy, treats, yes. 
And those calories do sneak up really fast, and there's and they're so desirable for a kid. That they have drug like effects. Exactly. He's probably going to eat. Uh, By the can, way, your your the brain is modeling so much as a kid that if you grow up eating like that when you're a kid, there's a certain percentage of that you'll never get back in the sense that their brain is going to start to mold itself off of these incredibly palatable foods to where it, they might never be able to enjoy whole natural foods the way they could have mm -hmm. because you, they experience these drug-like effects from all these you know, processed foods. It's really yeah, I ha I've, I've had a little bit of a, um, I guess we celebrated recently because we've had a bit of difficulty with our youngest kid um, when it comes to like just not, I mean, I guess just to trying healthy foods and like trying to consistently like seek it out himself. Uh, and recently, like he's been ordering fish on his own. <laughs> wow. I'm like, what the, like, like Brussels sprouts. Like he's like ordering all this stuff. If we go out to eat like on his own. And so I guess my, my thing right now is just to put a little encouragement out there to parents that, you know, it's not always like you might model it. You might have like the whole foods on display. You might be doing all the right steps, but your kid is still very resistant. It's it's a long game. It's yes. a long game. Yes, because it's, this is what you're weighing. The, my kid eats perfect now versus I, yeah. I help them develop the skills to be able to make good choices for the rest of their life. And, really, and it's a longer process. Really, it was yeah. the intensity that was uh, for us around it that was backfiring. So, totally. you know, for me to, to step back and just be like, you know, he's going to have some things like we're not going to provide it. Uh, you know, I know he's going to go to his friends or he's going to go. And sure. He's going to get some things like, you know, outside of our control. Um, but I mean, he was never like that far off. It was just like, it would just eat at me, you know, mm -hmm. it was just like, ah, like, why can't you eat more protein? Why can't we like uh, start, you know, in this sequence? And then like, you know, let's, let's, and he would always fight and try and like make his own food while as a dinner we're like having food i'm like no you have like we're eating this as a family and you know and there's all this intensity around it and so just kind of like pulled myself out of that and it's it's slowly been working so i just i wanted to throw that out there because it's it's a lot of this like yes you you can control your modeling and you can control the consistency but that's about it how so talk a little bit more justin about that like how you balance out because i also don't think you give in to just like imagine if you guys are having chicken or steak dinner and say rice vegetables whatever uh, whatever a staple dinner might look like at your house mm -hmm. and it might be something he doesn't like i mean does he get to go have pizza instead and, and have whatever he wants like no. how do you how do you manage like i don't like that i don't feel like that but at the same time too the default can't be uh, doritos and, and oh, stuff yeah, like, no. like yeah i guess yeah that's a good point i don't have that as like the <laughs> the fallback it's more like i like the steak but I don't like the broccoli and I don't oh, like okay. the uh, rice and I don't of the like choices that are there. the potatoes. Yeah. Like he didn't like anything else other than like one item, uh, Okay, you know? And then I'm like, well, that's all you're eating. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. You know, and, it's and, okay. it's, and, and you relax fight like, always. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And you're, and you're chill about it. I, yeah. you know, I think so. We've been like that with Max too. And there, and I, what I've noticed even in his short four and a half years is he goes through these phases of liking some things and not Bro, liking. they're learning. Totally. Yeah, you know, yeah. uh, Jessica makes a really good point with little kids. She's like, think about it when you're a little kid. Little kids or kids in general have no uh, control or autonomy. They're constantly being told what to do. What to so when they feel like they need control, they'll assert it uh, in places. And if you push, they'll push harder. So like mm -hmm. you said, you, you throw the intensity on. Yeah. Your kid fights back and you it's because they're told when to wake up, what to wear, where to go. Yeah. You know, so you give them a little bit of it's, autonomy. It's freedom. It's funny too how you can you can easily uh, influence them negatively without the intent of it. For example, this just happened. So it's funny we're having this conversation because because uh, again, I think Max has been just incredible with food. It's been it has been very easy for us. But there's times when again he doesn't yeah. like something. And uh, we made egg salad because of the talk about eggs recently. I've been trying to incorporate more eggs. So I'm like, you know, let's do some hard boiled eggs. Let's, yeah. let's try to incorporate more eggs into our, because that's an area he doesn't do a, a lot of eggs for breakfast. That's not a go to uh, thing. So, was this after we talked about that study? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, like, I, this, so again, right away, I'm trying to, to introduce that. So, Katrina made uh, egg salad sandwiches. He's never had that shit. I think I've only had that twice with her since we've been here. It's just not a staple thing that we would mm -hmm. make as an egg salad sandwich. So we're having it first time and I'm like really like excited to see how he's going to react. But because 
I'm over here. I'm like, mm, this is so good. Too much. Too much, yeah, dude. dude. So like, that's what I do. He, I he, he, he bit time. into it and he's like, and like, like spits overhyped. It. Yeah, like he never does that. And I'm like, and Katrina looked at me. She goes, "That was your fault." You know, hundred percent, right? dude. And I'm like, "What?" And she's just like, "Yes." She's like, "That's your son because you made it about you. Like you wanted him to like it. If you would have just ignored him, he would have ate it, and he wouldn't even said anything." That's because, me, dude. Yeah, I, I tried. I, totally, I, so I totally bad at that. fucked up, dude. Uh, I, and I know I did because I was like, I wanted him to be excited about it because I was in my funny. back. I've totally done that. Yeah, uh, normally yeah. I just ignore. I don't even pay attention to what she's. If feeding you act chill and you do your thing, I, yeah, she has to choose. Like she's like, that was all on you. She's like, you made a big deal about how good it tastes, and because of that, he was. I did so. I did this last night. So right, right before. So our three year old, he's potty trained, but at night he'll wear a diaper in case of accidents or whatever. But but right before he goes to bed. I want him on the toilet. Otherwise, what happens is I, I put him down, I, I stay with him in bed, and then he's like, oh, change my diaper. I'm like, oh, I gotta, you know, <laughs> we got to stop this process. So I want him to sit on the toilet. So last night, you know, I take him to the bathroom, and, you know, I try to goad him and excite him, and then I put him on, he kind of, you know, yells a little bit, and I was like, no, you got to go to the bathroom. And Jessica's like, you, you, you don't got to do that. I'm like, what do you mean? If he doesn't do that, then I got to change his diaper, I'll deal with that. She's like, just, this is all you got to do. And she basically, this is what she does. She just talks with him, hangs out. She slowly walks in the bathroom, does some stuff in the mirror or whatever. What does he do? He follows her, follows her in the bathroom, starts talking to him. They start having a good conversation yeah. while she's talking with him. He picks up a, a dental floss like she has. He's doing it. And, they're, and then she like pulls his pants down, sitting on the toilet and they're still talking like nothing. Yeah. Just relax the whole just time. Ninja style. Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. I'm like, do it, you know, yeah, I know. type of deal. I want to be the authority, which yeah. is just, <laughs> that's correct. So funny. Um, Adam, I want to ask you, cause you might not know, you might know this. Mm. What is the most durable car brand in the world as and now the 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 criteria is how long these cars actually stay on the road after they've been released or whatever? Toyota, Toyota. or Honda? Rolls-Royce. Oh, Rolls-Royce. Rolls yeah. Interesting. Yep. So Rolls-Royce is and I'll read you the stats. It's the most durable car ever made. Almost 3 quarters of the cars that have ever been produced in the company's history are still in active use wow. today. Wow, that speaks to the quality. Wow, it? I had no idea. I had no idea. Okay, so now I wonder if it's there the might be a little, or if it's there might be a little caveat to that because when people you, take care of them, yes, much. like yeah, you have a you have a four hundred thousand yeah. dollar plus car. You tend to sit in the garage, well pamper maintain it. it, pamper it. It only comes out on Fridays for dinner. And so it's really common to buy a 10 year old, you know, Bentley or Rolls Royce and yeah. it's still a nice car. So I wonder if that hmm. plays a role. I would definitely I mean, say it's got to be the most durable luxury car then. Yeah. Cause it, every expensive car. Yeah. Yeah. Like no, that. for sure. Uh, and, and there's actually lots of like, like Maserati is an example of like a luxury car that's got a bad reputation for like, oh, yeah, you'll have to fix something. Do they really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. That's, yeah. Maseratis. I like the way a, a Maserati looks, but that's one of the turnoffs is when you look at the reviews Don't on they have it. A Ford? Yeah. And they don't have enough horsepower. But don't they have a Ford engine? Me. I don't know who. Does Ford own Maserati? I think so. Really? Yeah, that ruined it for me. I didn't know that. Maybe that double check that. Ford owned, Maybe someone double checked that. I think but. Chrysler owned them for a while. Really? I don't know. That kind yeah, of, look up and see who. I didn't know that. So that, make, that makes me not so that not like. I mean, they're, they, they've, <laughs> you know they've got a gorgeous car. Uh, when we were out with uh, shopping like for Doug's, I remember dry, looking at this one they had there that was beautiful. But when I got online and I looked at like all the reviews, it's just a, what is it, Doug? Owned by Stella Atlantis, which was itself created in a merger between Fiat Chrysler Automobiles and mm. Peugeot. Okay. In 2021. Oh, I didn't know there was a merger. Okay, so like there's, that. it's much, it's more complex than I thought. Yeah, yeah, but you know, that's a, that's really well. I mean, it's a, it's a really, really expensive. And our, our Rolls Royce. This is something I don't know either. Our Rolls Royce handmade still. Is it like Ferrari and stuff like that, where it's, it's not a machine, it's not a factory. Every Ferrari's oh, handmade, right? Yeah, like, there's, a, there's, yeah, there's, a there's Italian dudes in there. They yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're just like really hardy and like. Yeah, tanks, they're right? made to order. Yeah, handmade. So, so I mean, that's just again, that's so yeah. So it's a, you're going to talk about like a so the quality of it. I is, wonder if because uh, handmade now means expensive, whereas before it meant like that's everything. I wonder yeah. if like because AI and stuff yeah. that's going to be like human made. Yeah, like yeah. hey, dude, this sandwich was made by a human. Like, yeah. you know, I, I do, I do, I do <laughs> think that. I do think like um, this is like why I think we'll see this kind of. We're gonna we're in the middle of this weird time of like like even like what we talked about before like. Uh, shoes now like knockoff shoes are super uh popular my buddies uh they were they were, were in this thread my these are my childhood best friends 
And one of the, th the things that's going right now in conversation is uh, these knockoff pro jerseys for like, if you want like a, like a, like a basketball or NFL authentic Jersey, you're paying like 170, 240 bucks for a, an authentic Jersey. You know, these, these knockoffs are like 20 bucks. Where do you get them? And they're, they're ordered from China or whatever. Yeah. Like they, can, they, can, can you Amazon tell? Or something? No, that's what my buddies are just like, you could not tell. Like it's wow. the, the, the detail. So my point is that we're in the middle of this, this time where the really, really expensive stuff is getting out competed by knockoffs that are like ridiculously cheaper. And I, but I, what I do think will happen over time is there'll, there'll be this resurgence of, as, I mean, look at art. Some art is done like so sick, right? Like you see this AI art that's being created and you're like, that is badass. So I think we're in the middle of like adopting a lot of that stuff. And then I think we're going to come back to like exactly what you said. It'll be like, well, who made this? Mm -hmm. Was it, did a person like creatively make this? Oh, I'm. What's the story behind yes. it? Yes. Yeah. And just, and, and uh, who is it? Who's your, your favorite guy? You always talk about the uh, musician that, um, um, uh, Rick Rubin. Yeah, Rick Rubin. He 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 talks about how you know, like real artistry is the the artist not creating something to go viral, not creating something to Just appease their, the mass. Completely their like, own interest. Yes, it's yeah. their it's this it's this selfish yeah. diary that they're sharing with the world, and you like it or you don't like it. Well, this story is so important, which is why some music and art is more valuable after the artist dies. Half the time. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, and then you hear about the story and the value goes up. Yeah, yeah. Because the story is really what people Did you see, so you're watching that that show I'm watching right now, Doug. There's a part in there where they they talk about a, a, a Patek Philippe watch that was worn by, I think, Eisenhower when he signed some crazy bill and like the the value of that. And it's like, it's just a watch. Because but I mean, of that. Because of the yeah. moment it's tied to. Wow. So yeah, I think we're going to see things like, I don't know, what's cool about AI and the ability for us to copycat and these like fake shoes, fake things like that is it opens up the market for anybody and everybody that wants to have or experience what it's like to have that. But I do think that there will still be this, uh, you know, high end market for it's, I mean, it's already man made. Been, I agree with you hundred percent. We already have evidence of that. Like yeah. used to be, if you were poor, you had horses. And if you were rich, you had cars. Now, if you're yeah. rich, you have horses. Yeah, no, people, people who own horses take care of them actually have money. It's so, so true. You know, speaking of that and talking about technology, are, are you? did you see they came out? I just saw, um, I think it was Sean Baker shared the report on the, uh, they, they just had a new study on the electric cars. Oh, that they produce more, that they're, they're, they're worse for the environment than what Yeah. Doing. Have you, how, how much, okay, so. I haven't I, dived enough. Okay. Deep I want you to dive into it. You're better at reading studies and stuff than I am. And because it's so hard to tell, like what, you, it's a bunch of propaganda war on both sides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard well, to sift through that and go like, okay, how much of this is like truth and how much of it is propaganda. So. It's interesting to think about too, because um, one thing and I know. I was listening. I think it was um, it was a former uh, CIA or FBI agent that was on like uh, Joe Rogan. He was talking about you know like lithium and cobalt. And, oh, like, and how it's mined. Mines and, and and who owns the majority of those around the world? And it's China. And China completely like monopolizing all of these mines to the point where if we're shifting in this direction, it, it goes right into their favor economically wow. uh, and where we're basically handing over like an entire industry uh, to make them a powerhouse even more. So it was just an interesting thought. Isn't that the same too? It, so the propaganda wise, I'm sure that plays into yeah, it. Yeah. 80% of the, of the uh, cobalt output there, there is owned by China. Well, then you add in too what they're doing power wise, right? Too. Like they're the only ones that are do pushing the nuclear right now, right? Are nuclear we, is, I don't, I mean, if somebody says that they care about the environment and they don't support well, it, like, to, they don't understand. Yeah, but back to Justin's point, I mean, if we're, it's, it's so, it's, uh, it's so much better economically that if they, it's like a race right now. And if we don't, we're going to get destroyed, right? Isn't that what's yep. happening? Like if they yep. get to a point where they have enough of these nuclear reactors that are producing energy, they'll supply energy for yep. the entire world yep. mm -hmm. and we'll have to buy from them because buying from them will still be cheaper than us producing yep. it our, yep. ourselves. Yeah, It'll, the, okay, so Doug, if you could look up like what actually powers yeah, look the at, power stations. You know what I'm saying? When you go to charge up, um, it, I believe it's still like energy plants. Still coal. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, we're still burning well, fuel happened, to produce uh, electric charge for people to charge their cars with. Yeah. So what's what are we doing? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs>
Speaking of energy, uh, okay, so I'm excited that we are going to mention Legion today because few usually when we work with a company that sends us a new supplement, either A, we're not that excited about the new supplement, or B, one or two of us is excited about the supplement, but rarely is it where they send us a bunch of bottles and we all take them. And are we're you like, are you talking I, about Lunar? Yeah, bro. I, and everybody is, that has to be one of the most effective supplements for sleep ever. I, I'm ever. Yeah. I, I, I definitely have uh, received some of the benefits. I, I went from like four down to two and then you, I swear you could find like your sweet spot. With Doug like says he does one two. tablet. Yeah. Is that all you're taking? Like, I just do just two. one. Yeah. I tell him, so maybe I should back off the four because I take four and it's like a coma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, yeah, but you, do you wake up too much for me? No, no. I, you, I should. I, yeah, that, I should explain that too. It's like I fall in asleep. Like I'm in a. And for me, I say that because I've, you guys all know I get up to pee two or three times. It's been now like like if I take that, I might one time get up, which is wild. So here's what's weird, Doug. Maybe pull up the supplement. I looked at the ingredients. And they're all legit ingredients that will help with relaxation and sleep, okay? But when I first looked at the ingredients, there wasn't, and this is like, of course, shame on me, right? There was no like, whoa, new discovered herb or whatever. I'm like, yeah, I'm familiar with these. You know, we'll see what happens. It, and then you take it and it works so effectively, improves the quality of your sleep. I know you guys are measuring your quality through your, yeah. your rings or whatever. This, what this shows me is how much other supplement companies lie. Because they'll say they have certain ingredients or certain amounts, mm -hmm. but they don't work the same. Yeah, you don't feel the effects. We know Mike, and Mike is very, he's a super stickler when it comes to, if it says it's got 500 milligrams, it has 500 milligrams. If it says it has this, it has that. Mm -hmm. Doug, I can't see because the screen is uh, messed yeah, up Yeah, it's up hard there. to see because it's small, oh, there but you go. Uh, it's glycine, theanine, GABA, melatonin. I mean, nothing that you would hear that's spectacular. Do you think maybe those salads, because because I don't know if I've ever taken a supplement with that blend of those things. And I know how theanine makes me. I like the way theanine yeah. makes me feel. I've I've thoroughly glycine's enjoyed. a good one. Glycine also. I, I don't I don't know if I've ever taken that bite yeah. or something like that. And we I know we've had GABA. stuff with GABA in it before. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so it kind of like chills out the brain. And then the melatonin dose is really low. So five hundred micrograms. Yeah, everybody takes way too much melatonin and disrupt their own melatonin. Production. And you know this because you'll wake up in the middle of the night uh, when it wears off. Would that be considered a micro dose yep. of melatonin? Yeah or, yeah, or appropriate dose, but compared to most melatonin <laughs> supplements will have three grams, five grams. Yeah. Yeah, this is half of a gram, right? 500, no, sorry, uh, milligrams. Sorry, this is half of a milligram. Most companies are three milligrams or five milligrams. Three to five. Milligrams. That's yeah. kind of not the, grams, milligrams. Sorry. Yeah, th yeah. Five, three to five milligrams is the typical dose yep. that you would get in like your regular over the counter. So, so yeah, no, it's been uh, interesting. So you no, know, uh, there's no concern because it's it's a micro dose of the melatonin that it's it'll gonna, it'll interrupt your your melatonin production. Yeah. Far less of a concern yeah. at that dose. So I, it, I did it for a while because it was so effective. But now what I'm trying to do is like intermittently use it, right? Like I, I think I went almost, I think two weeks without missing a day because I was just like, no way. Let's see if yeah. it works again. So it's like, okay, 14 days in a row, this thing, this stuff works for sure. And so, it's a chewable tablet, which I that's thought. That's why I like So it. I thought, why make it a tablet? Who cares? I swallow pills. That way you don't drink water right before I, you go to bed. That's why I love uh, it. Because one of the brilliant. things, one yep. of the things that I, okay, I, I swear by Mellow, right? So Mellow has been, and which is the magnesium is what I've needed, right? So I've, that's been the product that I always talk about for sleep. The one drawback is when I forget to do it like an hour or two before bed and I do it and I'm, so I'm drinking, yeah, yeah, then I'm drinking that thing of water to get it down. Yeah. And then that's just adding to my problem of having to pee all the time. So I do love that this is a chewable tablet. In fact, if our partners over at Net are listening to this, if you can make Mellow into a chewable, that would. I be think it. a chewable tablet for a sleep aid it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Period, because of the water. Aspect. Yeah, well, because I mean, I guess if you're not like me, because I don't drink a lot of water, but any water, like like I pee. yeah, I have to yeah. go pee, and it's the it's this weirdest thing. It's so funny because I was talking to my cousin about this. And I've actually never heard anybody else communicate it. And it's like, he, he he describes it exactly the same way that I feel. It's like, it's so annoying. that it's not like I get up and I'm like, oh, I'm having to pee so much because I drank so much water. It's like, just the feeling you have to pee a little bit 
Keeps you awake. Keeps me awake. Yeah. And I have to go to the bathroom and get out even the little bit that it is, which is so annoying. It's not even like- and It's I, always been like that since you were a kid. Yeah. For, and my- I know your my, uncle talks my about cousin, it. My cousin, my uncle, all-, all Weird. Yeah, all- You guys of, should get like, actually have your bladder scanned. I wonder if you actually do have a small bladder. I don't know. I know you say that. I don't know, but it's so <laughs> it's so annoying that, that that happens. And so, yes, the chewable uh, Lunar Legion, like Mike yeah. hit it out the park. With Speaking us. of supplements, yeah. uh, so one of the most- popular supplements that we've talked about from Organifi are their Shilajit chewables, right? And so, and it's just, it's, they're selling, they're selling them out like crazy. So I pulled up, this is medical news today. So just for people who are like, oh, you know, Shilajit, what is it? Whatever. This is a medical news today article and it's listing uh, benefits from Shilajit that are studied, that have, are shown in studies. So it's good for uh, Alzheimer's. So it's good for cognitive uh, performance. Um, it seems to show slow down the aging process when they measure it molecularly. Don't know what that means necessarily, but it's positive. Helps with anemia, antiviral, chronic fatigue. So people with chronic fatigue syndrome seem to do better. Hmm. Altitude sickness, liver hmm. cancer, heart health, obesity, and then this one, male fertility, um, and testosterone, which that's got a big, that's a, a big wow. impact. Yeah. What a, yeah. Wide range of benefits. It, it's a weird compound. It is literally like the, the like plant matter that's been, you yeah. know, underground for thousands and thousands and thousands Dense of years. Dense nutrients. And it, it comes out like black ooze. What yeah. is, yeah. So what is it? It's not, is it a fungus? Is it like a, is it like no, a it's biomass? It's yeah. broken down. It's like topsoil kind of, right? It's, it looks like, if you look up a picture, it looks like tar. It looks yeah. black and whatever. It's high in a fulvic acid and other nutrients. I think there's something else we haven't identified because yeah. it's been used as a supplement for a long time. I know it's how, like who, how does that happen? Like, <laughs> like mountain goat piss or something in there, <laughs> bro. People were desperate. People were desperate back in the day. Like there, there was always that one guy that's like, "I'll try that. Let's see what happens." Yeah, hey, let's let's give it. Did a whirl. Fred die? He didn't know. He <laughs> what, not only did not die, but he, what's he's interesting? Just like, what, yeah. What's interesting to me too is though, like it's not. I mean, and this is all supplements. It's not like it's very. It's not like you see it or you take it. It's like this profound, like instant thing it's like you would have to like you i'm, take gonna, it after I'm you gonna try it. this for a while and yeah, see if i yeah. notice these effects from it it's like that's weird to me it's it it's it's like i put in the category of uh because there's herbs that do super, certain things whatever i think it's more like a multivitamin in the sense that it the reason why it benefits all those things is i think that there's some potential deficiencies that yes. it may be filling is I, what i is no, what it feels I, like i think me. the same it's it's really like i think especially on the mineral side of yeah. things i think that we we just don't get that because like a lot of the plants don't even have can't pull from that anymore because of yeah. the way that we farm yeah. yep yep yeah. anyway that makes the most sense i got i so uh since we're talking about studies i read the most interesting i think obvious study when you think about it but they took a bunch they pulled a bunch of uh college-aged and middle-aged men and the it was a bunch of questions to see how the personality is how they viewed women uh relationships and then at the end, it was essentially like, um, would you have sex with a sex robot? Oh. Here's the connection that they found, which now makes a lot of, which, when I say it, it'll make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you guys this. What kind of guys are most likely to want to have sex or that would have sex with a sex robot? Well, what, what kind what, of guys? What do you mean by what kind Sims. of guys? Well, like, like what kind of, well, like, are we just, I mean, you're, you're kind of getting there. Like what kind of personality, what kind of, you know, I attitude? mean, somebody who's insecure and isolated and like on the computer and doesn't really like social interaction. Yeah. I mean, and, and this how do we the, just, the I, connection they made were the men that had the most negative views towards women oh, yeah. oh. were the most likely Okay. To want to have sex with the sex Oh, that robot. makes sense too, right? Yeah. Oh my God. Sad. Creepy. Isn't that yeah. sad? Yeah, I'm trying, you know, would you? Would you? Would I what? Have sex with a robot? Uh, no. You wouldn't even try it just to see? No. It's I mean, if you're talking to 14 year old me, I mean, I mean, you could ask me if I had sex with a couch. And I probably would say yes. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It. That's what I'm saying. But like 45 year old me? No, I wouldn't do. No, I'm not going to I mean, how many robot. days would it take? Yeah, I don't. I, <laughs> I don't think Let's I draw this out. Yeah, dude, let's see how long I don't you know last. how long I could last. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't think uh, even if they get to the point where they make them like so real human like, I don't think I would. That would I, make me less likely, by the way, because I'd be creeped out. You know, if it looked like mm. a human, and that would freak me out. Then you have sex with it. Oh man. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think I could because I, I mean, I I was I I've had friends right that can do the um, you know, what do you what's a I'm looking for a politically correct word. I don't want to get fucking <laughs> roasted. Right doll. Now. Oh, great. <laughs> I mean, what's the, what's the politically correct word for a whorehouse? What is it? Uh, <laughs> what is yeah. prostitution? A is brothel. It, a brothel. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Doug. I knew there. Sex, I knew, a sex worker. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, geez, yeah, right. Whatever. You know what I yeah. mean, right? Whorehouse. So. <laughs> Yeah, I you still said the word yeah, out. Yeah. just because you asked for the political correct term doesn't mean you didn't say the well, word. Well, no, I was trying to find it, I couldn't find yeah, it, so yeah. you're just getting the real one. So I don't think uh, there is a real term. Yeah, I mean, I've, I nice. I have friends that I have I've been with, I've been to places like this before, and they they have no problem. I and I never could like even like being young, young guy, single because you know that they don't actually get, like you. Yeah, like, so yeah, I, so I couldn't even I couldn't even get aroused in a in a situation in a yeah. moment like that. So I definitely don't think that a the most amazing robot could ever make that work for me which i've always tried to be like to, indistinguishable right well like, I, what i always like what made me like evaluate that is like what what is it about me that's different than my friends that could do that like what or what's different about them than me that why that's i mean they that's you, pure you need the connection yeah and that's pure objectification right they're yeah. objectifying they, the people like to the they point can where, dissociate yeah and they can yeah. just like uh you know Release, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you will. Dude. Yeah, I mean, they, they there was like like real enjoyment though from it. It's not. I don't feel like they were going there. Like, is that makes me feel like you would you would go and it's just like you know you're going. It's like it's it's something I need to do. I just need to go here and do this. Where it's like they were yeah. excited, like getting getting to oh, go yeah. there and the trip. Because yeah, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, and I'm just like ah, I'm not feeling this moment at like all. You know everybody. that they don't really want to be there. You're paying them. You know that they've just been with whoever. You know? yeah. yeah, and that's it, and because of all that. I, it doesn't, it doesn't turn me on and I don't yeah. care how, how beautiful the, the woman is or not. It's, it's not, a, a, it's not attractive for me or it doesn't get me aroused. So I can't imagine a, you gotta be arti- kind of like a pirate, an yeah. artificial yeah. robot. <laughs> what? That's, I definitely back, know. Those were the ones, you know, back in the day in history, right? It's oh, like, cause they're on a ship yeah, yeah, forever. Yeah, sea manatee. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. They get real horny out there at sea <laughs> for a while. What's going on. The, well, there's gotta be something right about your, your character that, that allows you to be able to disconnect and and do that like it's total it, objectification man it's it's i don't know it's wild but the, the robot thing is interesting because at some point like men and women are going to be presented with this option and i imagine it's going to be there's going to be this conversation what's going to be like oh i you know oh i like my robot better than a man because a man is this and he doesn't listen to me and he doesn't whatever and this one just you know or i like my robot girl because she serves me. She does whatever I want. She's never mad at me or whatever. So they're much better. This is going to be a weird conversation potentially mm. or, or situation. I mean, I believe it. I believe it'll happen though. I think that'll be the next quote unquote human rights argument. That's what I think. I, yeah. I think they're going to start like, oh, well, this this robot has a right yeah. to marry. I've seen that Black Mirror episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, gonna, thank it's you. gonna get weird. Yeah, hey, uh, uh, I got the I got the shout out today. In fact, I'll save this shout out, Doug, for the next one, so you don't forget because you already have it written. out. shout out, and I'll give you the shout out on the show that I referenced because I haven't we haven't referenced like a good show. Recently found Gentleman on Netflix. It is a Guy Ritchie film. So if you liked his style, um, so good. I haven't. I don't think I've got into a good Netflix. Netflix is not my favorite streaming service of all the streaming services, um, as far as the quality. Right, we, I've referenced them as the junk food of streaming yeah. service. Right, um, but I definitely think that this is was well done. So if you guys haven't checked that out, I know Doug started it. You guys haven't started watching it yet, have not you? Yet, yeah. yeah, check out Gentlemen on uh, on Netflix. Hey, in today's episode, you heard us talking about terzepatide and semaglutide. These are the GLP one agonists that you've probably read about uh, in the news, um, otherwise known brand names, Wegovi, Ozempic, super effective peptides for weight loss. It's uh, groundbreaking stuff. Anyway, we work with doctors. They work with GLP-1 agonists. They also work with other peptides, and they work with hormone therapy. If you'd like a referral, if you'd like a prescription or learn more, go to mphormones.com. All right, back to the show. First question is from Bree Strong. What is the best exercise to get rid of mom pooch? Mm. Okay. Well, first let's define that. So this I'm assuming is not just extra body fat in the midsection because you know that would be getting leaner, right? When people say mom pooch, and I've had a lot of clients who have referred to this. In fact, I remember one woman in particular. Um, she had three it's kids. Hired me. We trained. We worked out together, and she got really fit. She got really fit and lean. And she said, you know, it's really weird. So she goes. My lower 
midsection kind of pooches out. And it was never like that before. Before I had kids, when I was an athlete, similar leanness, I didn't have that kind of pooch. This, I was an early, this is back in the day when I was kind of just getting started. And so I looked at the muscles involved with pulling in the midsection and it, it really became clear to me. So when you, when you have a child, there are muscles that surround the core, the, the, the transverse abdominus is, is the main one that hold everything in second. So when you suck in your stomach, that's the muscle you're contracting. Mm -hmm. Well, when you have a child, that muscle has to stretch and atrophy yeah. in order to make room. After you have the baby, if you don't specifically target and strengthen that muscle, it remains or it will remain somewhat atrophied. So you can work your abs, your obliques, but not really develop the TVA back to where it was before. And because gravity pushes organs down, it doesn't hold things in like it used to, you'll get this pooch. So the exercises you want to do are ones that strengthen and work the Back TVA. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I have two two thoughts. One is that I think that is absolutely true because I actually seen this even on my own physique. Uh, obviously, I didn't carry a kid and have that, mm. but, you but it was just a burrito. From, yeah. <laughs> yes. a little Joey pouch. <laughs> yes. This is kangaroo. this was something that uh, I remember getting ready for uh, my first show. Or it was before I even decided to get on stage. It was when I was like kind of prepping to see what it would look look like to do my first like real hard cut. And I got down to sub 7% body fat and even that lean, I'm like, you're pretty shredded at 7% body fat. I still had this like pooch. Like extra body fat. Yeah, power, extra yeah. body fat that was just stubborn. And what I realized was I had to go back to a reverse diet, bulk up, add some calories in the diet again, but staying lean. Obviously, I put on a little bit of body fat, but like stayed under 10%, but put on or put on muscle, add, bulked up. And then came back down again, cut really hard, got sub 7% again. Then a little bit of it went away. And I did that about two or three times uh, before I felt like it went away. Completely. You're referring to the to stubborn body fat. White, white fat is that stubborn body fat, whereas brown is more uh, thermogenic and active. And brown fat will burn faster uh, than white fat. And there's things you could do to convert white to brown. I don't know how much mm. of an effect it has, but things like submerging yourself in cold, cold water, range, yeah. strength training. And then I think getting yourself down to a certain point, I think then once you get rid of it, uh, it doesn't, it's, it, it doesn't come back in the same way. Yeah. It just, it, and it, <clears throat> I mean, it eventually does like if could, because I carry more body fat now it's there again. But once I did that, uh, and as long as I kept my calories in check and I was strength training consistently, then it, it maintained yeah. staying, uh, staying lean there. But I did notice that. So I think the combination of both working on, uh, TVA core exercises, the drawn maneuver, the vacuum pose, uh, those are great exercises to strengthen the muscle, to pull it back in. And then also understanding that it, it, if there is some body fat still there and it's not just atrophied muscle, that and it's just stubborn body fat, you know, as you continue to get leaner, reverse diet, get leaner again, reverse diet, leaner again, uh, it eventually will, will by, go to. By the way, like, uh, like again, drawing back to that story, I remember when I learned about the TVA then and I said, oh, okay, we can get on hands and knees and I want you to draw your belly button in towards your spine like you're trying to suck in your stomach, do it as hard as you can. So I did this exercise with her. Now, keep in mind, at this point, she was fit. We'd done core exercises, you know, abs are good, obliques she are good. She couldn't even connect. She had trouble connecting yeah, yeah. to drawing in. She yeah. would draw in just a little bit. I'm like, you can't draw in anymore. She goes, no. And I'm like, light bulb, like, okay, this is the issue. And then through practice, yeah. she was able to draw in more and more. And then it did. It shrunk her waist. I think it came down like a quarter or half an inch just from strengthening that muscle. Next question is from Aaron MLLT. I'm experiencing pain under my left clavicle after tricep dips. What am I doing wrong? This is uh, sounds like a chromioclavicular pain joint pain, right? AC joint yeah. is typically what's happening. Um, shoulder mobility, stability, and shortening the range of motion and slowly working on a larger range of motion, but going with less resistance. If you have AC joint pain and you push it mm -hmm. too hard with this exercise, it's not going to be it's good. It's going to backfire. Yeah. yeah. I, and I've had a lot of clients that have shoulder mobility limitations that try to dip and they really feel the uh, pain and, and restriction there. Uh, so it's definitely something like maybe 
that that should be like an entire focus is really to like open up uh you know range of motion and, and strength there with a lot of mobility drills before really like diving mm. too much into dips do you think because there's a discrepancy from left to right for this person that they would they would obviously see this in like our zone one, one our zone one test like oh we, yeah yeah i mean it, good idea so this i mean again this is uh stressing why er, like everybody that listens to this podcast if you go through any of our major programs prime is a program that you all should it, it, it highlights if you were if you were to hire me as a trainer the first thing that i would do is prime I would do a full assessment on you to look for these types of things. If I was to do a zone one, zone two, or zone three test, and I see a major discrepancy left from your left to your right on your shoulder. And what I mean by that is like, so this person, I'm guessing, if they were to do our prime pro zone, you would see the left, the right. You would difference. see when they go to put get themselves in that zone one test, that one side's probably going to be off the wall significantly more the other side. And then then it's very obvious when we go in to do an exercise like a dip that the reason why you're feeling that is yeah. due to your shoulder mobility stuff. It's gonna it's gonna show up on that left side in that test. Yep. And then it will work, it, it'll find its way into issues into different movements. You know, the, the way that I when I was younger got myself to be able to do really deep dips early on was I used a weight assisted dip machine and put enough assistance to where I could do a deep dip without pain or without too much struggle. And I practiced in there and slowly added less assistance, less assistance. And it got me to be able to do the, a full dip. The other way to do it, like, and this is actually still to this day, how I can go cold into really deep dips. I'll walk over to the dip bar and actually Stand, standing up right without my feet elevated and get, put myself stretch there in that yeah. position and then hold an isometric position oh, right there yeah. so i get Squeeze real connect to, yeah so yeah, i can connect bottom. to the really really deep position and then i come out of that versus yeah. what most people do is they jump up start at the top and they start at the top and they come down into the position i actually get myself into the deepest position i want to go i get and connected in the isometric position that's kind of how i warm up and then i go into the exercise from there mm. that really really uh will help but nonetheless back to my original point to the audience that if you're running any of our programs you should also be have prime it should complement anything that you're doing and should go through that so that when you run into these issues you have a reference yeah. to go back and be like right. gotta address oh, it you can't ignore it yeah and then and, and in there like it, like if you if you fail on the zone one there's movements there's shoulder mobility movements that will improve that and what's awesome is if that's the the reason which is probably what it is you go do those exercises that we have in there, those priming movements before you go do a dip. And you should first time see, feel a difference. It may not eliminate it completely, but it should already start to move in the positive direction of how you feel from that. And that's your right away. Your sign is like, that's the, that's the problem. That's the root cause. I need to address this. Next question is from Meg's daily wellness. You mentioned in a previous episode that volume should be higher when bulking. So what rep range is best to train in during a bulk is one more beneficial than the other increasing weight versus increasing reps I, well i think you need to clarify should i don't think you said should i think the, the comment can. was you can yes yeah. yes when you're bulking and you have a lot of calories that's when you can add more volume to yeah, your the training point of your, with a lower risk of overtraining. yes your point of that to make this clear to the audience was not that you should increase volume for sure just because you're in a bulk it's that if you were going to <laughs> increase volume, you're more likely to be able to handle it. But you very well could be not in a bulk already overtraining yeah. your volume. And then you go into a bulk just because you're having a, a few hundred more calories, you you go too much volume. So you could still do too much volume. 100%. Yeah, especially volumes you go to for the way you train yes. all the time. Yes. Yep. So to interrupt that and do something, you know, with less reps and, you know, like crank the intensity a bit, you know, might be like the perfect shift. Right. Now, as far as rep ranges are concerned, like the, the best, rep, the rep range is going to give you the best results uh, in that, especially in that initial five to six week period is a new rep range, regardless if you want to bulk, if you want to cut, maintain, whatever, it's that new rep range. Now that all being said, okay, if, if all of that is equal and, and you're starting out uh, well, not, let's say you're starting out. Let's just say all rep ranges would pose that same initial, um, you know, like a novelty signal to your body. Then I think higher reps are probably better in a bulk and lower reps are probably better in a cut, mainly because of the volume issue, which we talked about earlier. But I do want to be clear. It's not like this 
massive effect. It's not like you go from now, unless you're like you're you're super low and deficient in calories. But the difference between a good appropriate cut and a bulk in terms of volume is not like you add fifty percent more volume to your training. Well, I have I have a different way to communicate this question, right? So the, the better, back half of this question is 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 one more beneficial than the other? Increasing weight versus increasing reps. Oh yeah. I would push you in the direction of whichever one of those two is more novel for you, meaning that right. there tends to be two types. There tends to be a division between the type of person that you are. You're normally one or the other. Uh, and I'll use Justin and I as an example wow. of this. If Justin and I are going after our workouts, this is just our typically, doesn't mean that all the time, but typically I'm the guy that would lean towards more volume, more reps. He would be the guy to go add more weight to the bar. So if you're asking yourself, what should you do in this situation? Doing the opposite is going to yield probably the most return for you. So because Justin knows that he's the guy that likes to push weight and push strength more than he likes to add a bunch more of reps and exercises to his routine. And he's like, man, I'm trying to get change. I'm trying to see change in my body. Yeah, this is maybe a time I should probably go the volume. Same, and the opposite is true for me. I'm typically the guy who's like, oh, I'll just do a superset or I'll add an extra set or some more reps where it's like, you know what? I, you know, let's challenge myself weight wise. Let's add more weight to the bar. So ask yourself, which one are you more likely to probably do? And then go the opposite direction because the novel stimulus in the bulk will probably yield more gains for you. Next question is from Ben Melton Coach. How important is it to? correct things like posture, muscle imbalances, and core strength before adding strength training, or can they be done alongside each I'm other? I'm going to change the question because it's posing the question Either in a way or. that is is actually presenting inaccurate in information. Um, here's what the question should say. How important is it to correct things like posture, muscle imbalances, and core strength before trying to add more weight to the bar or just keep getting stronger? Okay, because correcting posture, muscle imbalances, and core strength is strength training. It's all strength training. So yeah. if I'm trying to correct, work on your posture, if I'm trying to work on a muscle imbalance, I use strength training to do that. Now, how important is it that you correct those things before you just add weight to the bar? Imperative. It's imperative because if you add load to your body without correcting those things, you will strengthen those imbalances. Yep. If, you're, if you have this imbalance between your right shoulder and your left shoulder where your right shoulder hikes up every time you do a row – and you just you don't like, forget it. I'm not going to correct that. I'm just going to add weight to the bar. You're going to make that problem stronger. Yeah. It's going to be harder to correct. And you're going to present yourself with potentially worse problems. So like trainers know this, good trainers know this. You don't add weight to the bar if there's an imbalance. You fix that first. That's always first. Yeah. There's nothing to add to that. I mean, that's literally like, that's exactly how you address. Uh, maybe, maybe the add to that is like, what are some of the ways you do that? Like switching over to unilateral movements, yeah. doing corrective work, right? Because again, to your point, all of it's strength training. Mm -hmm. So just because I, I switch over to unilateral work, I'm still strength training. I'm just now more concerned that I want to keep the, the left and the right side equal. You know what I think about? Do you remember that DEXA scan we got from that listener yeah. who followed map symmetry? Yeah. So when you, here's the, and here's the selling point, and I'm going to sell everybody on why they need to do this. Because I know people listening, if, me, if I was a kid, I'd be like, whatever, I don't care. I just want to gain muscle. <laughs> all right. This young woman was already well-trained. So she was a young woman, already strong, already fit, built. She followed MAP symmetry. She got a DEXA scan before and after. And what she saw in the DEXA scan was, I don't remember what side it was, but her left side was a little bit smaller than her right in terms of lean <laughs> body mass. And every nobody's perfect. Nobody has exact 100% the same. But she had a discrepancy between her left and her right side. She followed MAP symmetry, gained three pounds of muscle, which for her was a big deal because she'd been working out for a while. And it all went to the areas that she needed it. Mm -hmm. she, and now, ha, would she have built that muscle had she not focused on correcting that discrepancy? My argument would be no. Right. Or maybe she would have, but she would just have created a greater, discre gap. A greater discrepancy. Right. Yeah. Which, so now the point of this is it's all strength training. So yeah. it's not like you're like foregoing building muscle and changing your body because you're working on imbalances. That's, it is part of it. Well, I also want to make the point because you guys kind of brought up mobility too. It's like where the discrepancy lies a lot of times you don't um you don't ever really focus on certain ranges of motion uh and you have to treat that like you're a beginner in like certain angles you're probably very strong and proficient up to a certain degree but then you know anything further than that mobility is strength training you're you're connecting your recruiting muscles to to be able to support and and provide you with a way to to be stronger 
uh, in that movement, but you have to learn it all. It's almost like you're learning it from scratch if you haven't really focused on that. And so that's why like mobility, it looks like it's just stretching, but you're literally building up strength from a safe, uh, you know, body weight perspective. Then we start slowly adding load. And so it's a gradual process, but you can get to the point where, um, you know, it's supporting your your major muscles and you're, you're just about as strong in new ranges of motion, which builds up the, your entire body mass. Even more. This is why people who are experienced who've done this before will tell you like they went lighter, got better range of motion, built more muscle. Yep. So you are not sacrificing progress for this. This is how you progress. Look, if you're a hard gainer, if you have a tough time building muscle, gaining weight, just can't seem to figure out how to pack on the mass, check out our free hard gainer guide. Go to mindpumpfree.com. You can also find us all on social media. Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. I'm on Instagram at mindpumpdestefano. And Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam.